assistant for the former assemblyman, William D. Payne. She received her associate's degree in criminal justice from Ernest University. Um, her first anthology, I Am Who God Says I Am, Living My Life on Purpose, was published on September 26, 2019, on her 50th birthday. She is also a contributing author to Women's Frontline Magazine, the November 2017 issue, and Victorious, Victoria, Victorious Victors and Value um, Magazine, January and February 2017. Keisha is a proud member of the Church of the New Covenant, of the New Covenant Women's Speaker Association and a Silver life member of the NAACP and executive committee member. And we thank Keisha for coming with us, being with us on today. Thank you, thank you. It is such an honor. I will not be before you long. Um, I, you know, when Yasha asked me to participate, it was such an honor. And I, I was like, God, what am I going to do? Okay, God. <laughs> um, so he actually gave me two affirmations uh, that I had actually, these are actually in the book that I am currently in. And so he, he told me, he said, these can be combined because they do coincide with each other. And those are, I'll get stronger with every test and I am who God says I am. I derived those from Galatians chapter six, verse nine and Romans chapter eight, verse one. And let us not be weary in well-doing for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So I ask you, how long have you been in your season of tests? I can only imagine. I know it feels like the season never goes away and you may feel, may not feel it, but your tests, your trials, they really do come to make you stronger. God does not allow things to happen to you in order to wipe you out, but he allows them to make you stronger technology. I love it. And as I look back over my life, I realized that God brought me through so much stuff. I lost my mother when I was 15, burying her on my 16th birthday, abortion not too long after graduating from high school, baby before being married, my first child before being married, married to a man not sent to me by God. And another thing, one thing that I know Yasha did not know, jail time, sleeping with married men, not believing in myself, not knowing my self-worth, yet God saw fit to have me right here at this point in time. I learned how to trust God, to trust his word and not the words of society. I learned how to forgive myself. Yes, I learned how to forgive myself. Who are we not to forgive ourselves after we ask God for forgiveness? For some reason, we believe the words of those who did not create us, society. We hear, you can't do this. You'll never make it. God didn't tell you that. You know, you know what you did when you were younger. You know how you used to be. So why is it so hard for us to believe the words of our creator? How often do you look in the mirror and wonder who you are? Society constantly will remind us of who we are not. I need you to remind, to remember that we are created in God's image. We are his perfect creation. And I encourage each and every one of you that are on, that can hear me today, 
know that with every test, you will get stronger and that you are who God says you are. So I encourage you to please stop listening to society and start listening to the voice of our creator, God. Be blessed, thank you. Amen, amen. We are who God says we are and we've been created in his image. Thank God for women. And now we will have uh, Reverend Moore to come and give his presentation regarding women in history. So we can see some of the accomplishments of some of these women who understood presumably who God made them to be and lived it out and are living it out. Amen. Reverend Moore, you can take the floor at this time. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, Reverend Porter and all of the leadership at the Community Church of God of Plainfield, New Jersey. I'm so thankful to be before you um, to speak on this topic. I'm just going to um, share my screen so I can. Wonderful. You can see I have a lot of stuff up on my screen. <laughs> All right. Wonderful, wonderful. So everyone can see our history is our strength. Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. I just, I appreciate the confirmation. <laughs> okay. Um, so again, thank you for this opportunity to um, speak on the subject of African-American women, black women, the tenacity, courage, intelligence, and creativity of black women indoors. Yes, yeah, so I am just thankful to be here and just ha so happy to be able to share with you. So I would like to begin with a question because I'm sure as you've already noticed, I am a man <laughs> and we are uh, celebrating Women's History Month. So I've, I felt it appropriate to start with the question, who am I within the context of this conversation on black women? What qualifies me to speak with you about women in this sacred space? What is my perspective? And how do I come to this most special discussion? Well, to answer that question, I would, I would like all of you to know that I am first and foremost a child of God. Secondly, I am a son to two wonderful parents uh, raised by a strong Black woman who you can see in that Black and white picture with the Afro. Um, I was also, I am also a brother. Um, as you can see, a, a picture of my sister just under my mother in the middle. I am also a proud and happy husband, uh, married to Miss the formerly uh, Miss Angela Rodriguez, now Miss Mrs. Angela Rodriguez Moore, and I am also a son in love um, because my mother and my mother in love and I call each other in love and not in law. Um, because she just calls me her son. So ultimately, I am a man who recognizes, respects, and appreciates all that Black women are because of how I was raised and shaped and influenced by Black women. I'm a man who was, again, raised, nurtured, and loved by strong Black women. I understand that everything I am or could ever hope to be is through God's grace manifested through the loving compassion of black women. Thus, I enter this space not seeking to speak for women, but to honor and thank women for their unmatched contribution to humanity. So because in speaking on the topic of African-American women or black women, because I want to acknowledge the diaspora, black women, um, is, is, is a rather expansive topic. I've, I deemed it best to hone our focus and my focus to African-American women within the history of church, of the church, 
because as we are a people of faith. So my thesis or my point of departure for our conversation is the black church has been able to survive and thrive because of the presence, persistence and power of African-American women. So when we embark on this conversation, we need to be mindful of the role of women in scripture. And this is nothing more than a snapshot of women within our biblical text. So if you go back to the Old Testament, when we talk about um, Hagar, uh, the, uh, Abraham's, Abraham's uh, second wife, uh, when he was, um, you know, convinced uh, by Hagar to have, I mean, convinced by Sarah to have a, have a son um, by her maidservant, Hagar. Um, it's, it's important, I think, to, to note that Hagar was um, an African woman, first and foremost. Um, secondly, um, Hagar had a direct encounter with God in the wilderness when she left Abraham. And thus, we get one of our first names of God, if you will, from an African woman, because it was Hagar who called God El Roy, which means the God that sees me. Also, when we think of our activist roots, we think about the midwives um, in the Israelite nation during the period of Egyptian bondage and how Moses uh, was saved. Think about Zipporah, Moses's African wife, uh, think about the daughters of Zolophad, who advocated on, you know, on, on behalf of themselves for inheritance rights once their father, once their father died, and thus was created in the Deuteronomic text um, provisions to uh, to provide for women in the in the event of the deaths of their spouses or fathers. And then you're very familiar with Deborah. You're familiar the judge. You're familiar with Jail. Um, who killed Sisera with the tent peg. And you're also uh, familiar with Ruth, um, who had the relationship with Naomi, which led to um, her marrying Boaz and just the ministerial uh, role that Ruth played in, in mentoring and um, helping, in helping Naomi. Um, in the New Testament, we need to be mindful that women were an integral part of Jesus's ministry. Women were the first to see the resurrected Christ, you know, which is, which is the linchpin of our faith. And so Jesus show, showed himself first to women. And then women are key agents in spreading the gospel message as a part of the early church when you study the book of Acts. When you think about Mary, the mother of Jesus, um, Tabitha, a.k.a. Dorcas, um, Mary, uh, the mother of John Mark. Who was a, a woman of means who, you know, opened up her house as a church, Lydia of Thyatira, and also Priscilla of uh, Priscilla uh, of the uh, ministerial couple Priscilla and Aquila. And we need to be mindful that, you know, in the in in the biblical text, whoever's mentioned first has prominence. Whoever's mentioned first, we are supposed to, you know, recognize as as a person of importance and authority. And notice here in the biblical text, we have Priscilla, not Aquila and Priscilla, but Priscilla leading the husband. So again, you know, speaking to her role and her prominence within the context of ministry. So when we fuse that with our African context, we have to be mindful of a couple of things. One, that Christianity had been present in North Africa, Northern Africa since the first century. Christianity was also a part of Egypt since the first um, to the second century AD, and that by the fourth century AD, Christianity was the state religion of Ethiopia, and still is. However, this is this these truths occupy, or exist in tension, with that with it, with regard to the West African context because um, for the West African they were exposed to what we would call a colonizer Christianity which was actually antithetical to the gospel and more focused on control uh, rather than liberation and salvation. 
And so we also need to be mindful of this tension because the Europeans' use of the Bible as a means to control African people continued on the plantations of North America. So when we think about Christianity in chains, the Christian orientation of the enslaved, if you will, we need to be mindful. And a, a number of you, are, you know, I'm sure you're already aware, but many enslaved African Americans did not receive any religious instruction at all because their enslavers were not Christian or because they deemed blacks as soulless creatures who did not need salvation since upon death, they ceased to exist because that was a common belief that we, you know, or a common lie that was, that was perpetuated as, as truth within these racist enclaves that, you know, blacks had no souls. But even more so, the religious instruction that many enslaved people received only supported the contention that they were less than human. So once again, you know, the Bible as disseminated from the, the plantation owner or the master of the enslaved to the enslaved um, African-American was that of, of control. And look at this perspective from Miss Jenny Proctor, who was, who was a woman who spent time in bondage in, Al in Alabama. This is part of the uh, WPA um, collection of, of, of the narratives of enslaved people. There was no church for the slaves. So we went to the white folks arbor on Sunday evening and a white man would get up to preach to the, excuse my language, but you could see it there, to preach to the niggers. He said, now, as I take my text, which is nigger obey your master and your mistress cause what you get from them in this world is all you're ever gonna get. Because just like those hogs and the other animals, when you die, you ain't no more after you've been thrown in that hole. So this was part of the theological orientation that black women and men were exposed to while they were in bondage. So, what actually involved, what actually evolved, I should say, excuse me, was the tension within, within Christianity that in some ways still exists today, um, though not necessarily as clear as slave holding and slave. But um, this, this idea was best, I think, was best articulated by Dr. Kelly Douglas Brown, um, who, is, who, who serves at Union Theological Seminary, and she's uh, also a, an Episcopal priest. But in her book, The Black Christ, she developed, you know, this, you know, this comparative dynamic between slave holding Christianity and slave Christianity. And we need to be mindful that slave holding Christianity is the Christianity or the version of Christianity that was um, that the slave master or the master of enslaved persons tried to indoctrinate into the minds of enslaved people. And we know that Christianity to in fact be dehumanizing. We know that the Bible was used as a tool of oppression to keep black people under control. Um, it supported the idea that, uh, or supported white exceptionalism as the new chosen people, though this was not scripturally supported, but white people perpetuated this idea that they were God's chosen people now. It defied, uh, it defies Christ to de um, excuse me, it deified Christ to em to de-emphasize his ministry to the oppressed. So where they pushed uh, Christ as God, the Imago Dei, which is something that we believe and we stand upon, they they talked very little, if at all, about his earthly ministry because Jesus's earthly ministry dealt with. Um, liberating oppressed communities, liberating oppressed people. And it only viewed the cross as, as a means of salvation. You need to just, you know, just need to get saved. Don't worry about anything that's going on in this world. Get saved, deal with whatever you have to deal with, die and you'll go to heaven. But slave Christianity, that was the version of Christianity that was practiced by our ancestors. And that Christianity was adaptive and organic because it fused our some of our traditions and, and belief systems and worship practices from Western, West Africa with the Christian faith 
that we were being exposed to. And as we learned more about the biblical text, we saw the themes of justice and liberation. So we saw the text as a tool of liberation and not a tool of oppression. You know, we realized that we were made in the image of God. We realized that God cares about the enslaved. We realized that God cares about women, that God cares about people uh, born with uh, physical disabilities. So in, in essence, slave Christianity or the Christianity of the enslaved acknowledges the humanity of oppressed people. And it also deifies Christ relationally, meaning that we know that Christ is the Imago Dei. We know that Jesus is God incarnate, yet we still embrace his incarnate ministry to the oppressed. You know, that's what sealed it for us. This God who came down from, as the old preachers say, 40 and two generations, came to earth and flesh and cared about poor folks. He cared about women. He cared about the oppressed. He cared about those born with physical infirmities. You know, and that's, you know, that's what made this faith real to us. And as we continue to be oppressed, our, our version of Christianity, this Christianity of the enslaved viewed the cross as a parallel to black suffering and the resurrection as their eternal hope for freedom. So as Jesus died and resurrect was, was, you know, was resurrected, so will we be resurrected in the dynamic of freedom and justice. Now that with that, all that said, we have to think about black women as carriers of this Christian faith. Because people of West African descent come from a matriarchal tradition. Now, those are our roots, which means that our family lineage was usually defined through the mother. Further, West African cultural traditions and practices um, are led and come through women and religion is no exception. These beliefs and practices, the matriarchal aspect of our culture, um, the, 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 the influence of, the, uh, of women within our, in our worship traditions, in our, in our religious practices and in our theology survived the middle passage and slavery. Therefore, black Christianity as we practice it has always been informed or influenced by our West African matriarchal tradition. So we have always stood on the shoulders of black women. So even though we might have a, a bunch of male preachers and even though women may unfortunately still experience sexism and discrimination within the context of the church, we are still standing on the shoulders, theologically, philosophically, with regard to our ortho practice and beliefs on the show. We are still standing on the shoulders of black women because we see our theological articulations and practices coming through black women. So when we think about this dynamic in the, uh, of the South during the period of slavery, we also have to be mindful of what was going on in the North. So as, so as enslaved women in the South helped to define and live out their faith in the midst of direly oppressive bondage, they helped to create a theology and practice that showed Black people how to survive, persevere, and overcome through their faith in God. Now, however, in the North, African Americans participated and, in, and joined various denominations, namely uh, the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Episcopal Church. Uh, but you know, so we see um, African American women and men being able, you know, you know, begin beginning to participate in denominational um, Christianity. However, as they continue to experience racism. 
black people began to form their own churches and denominations, as you well know, like the African Methodist Episcopal Church and also independent uh, Baptist churches. And it is in these spaces where we begin to see women make great contributions as clergy persons in leadership, if you will. So what I like to do now is kind of talk about what I call, what I, what I, who I would deem as the founding mothers. You know, these, these matriarchs of our African-American Christian tradition um, that, you know, we don't talk about nearly enough. So when we're looking at the 1700s or the 18th century, um, going into the 19th century, who were some of these key people? And the earliest account of an African woman preaching we have is of a woman who, who went by the name Elizabeth. We don't have a last name, unfortunately, who was born enslaved in Maryland in 1766. But we know that by the 1800s that she had begun to preach throughout Maryland and Virginia and other parts of the uh, Eastern seaboard. And she was a woman who was a part of the Methodist tradition because um, this was a period historically known as the Second Great Awakening. And Methodists, you, white Methodists used to do revivals all over the colonies. And a, a, a number of people, white and black, you know, came to faith um, through these Methodist revivals. Now, Elizabeth, she was an exceptionally courageous woman because she preached, her preaching context was mainly in Maryland and Virginia. And she was preaching against slavery. You know, she worked, she was a part of the abolitionist movement. Now you wanna talk about putting skin in the game. You know, how many men were down in the, black men were in the South or white men for that matter, preaching against slavery in states that practice slavery. But here we have this early example, one of the earliest examples of an African woman preaching and she's standing flat footed preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and speaking out against slavery. And here's this quote from her autobiography. I also held meetings in Virginia. The people there would not believe that a colored woman could preach and moreover that she had no learning. They strove to imprison me because I spoke against slavery. And being brought up, they asked by what authority I spake, and if I had been ordained. I answered, not by the commission of men's hands. If the Lord had ordained me, I needed nothing better. And this woman preached the gospel in revivals, like I said, Maryland, Virginia, and all over the eastern seaboard for the better part of 50 years. This woman, Elizabeth, our matriarch of the African-American church and, and, and of African-American preachers had a 50 year ministry. A woman, another woman you may be familiar with is uh, Urena Lee. Urena Lee was you know, born in Cape May, New Jersey. And she was the first woman to be licensed by the African Methodist Episcopal Church in 1816. Now, as seminal a moment as that was, that licensing, you know, did come uh, with a, you know, with certain limitations. Um, she was allowed to preach, um, but she was not allowed, according, you know, from what everything I've read, she was not licensed to um, administer any of the church sacraments. So, you know, in terms of uh, maybe, you know, like baptism or communion or things of that nature. Yet Lee served as an itinerant minister. And when I read about her schedule, it was complete. It was what we would call brutal. She was on the road, you know, over a hundred days per year. And when I'm talking about being on the road, I'm saying that she, you know, she preached over, well over a hundred, had, she had well over a hundred preaching engagements a year. Now they're 52 weeks in a year. So, you know, she was, you know, she was doing double duty. And 
what I read that even blew my mind even further is that, you know, she traveled a lot by foot. So she's walking to a lot of these places and her travels included New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, and even Ohio. She was also an abolitionist who worked with, you know, who again, you know, talked about the evils of slavery and worked as a member of the um, American Anti-Slavery Society um, up until her death in 1864. Another woman I'm sure that you're familiar with, another founding mother in my purview is Sojourner Truth, um, formerly known as I Isabella Bumphrey, who was born into slavery in New York. Um, she escaped uh, slavery because New York, like New Jersey, had a gradual system of emancipation. So even though the laws were on the book as of 17, I mean, excuse me, uh, as of 1827, um, people could still, you know, remain in some form of bondage, you know, years after that. So she ended up escaping. And, you know, by that point, her, her, her freedom was secured. But she became a Christian in, in 1828, um, converted denominationally to Methodism in 1843. Um, and it's at that time that she changed her name to Sojourner Truth uh, because she believed that it was, you know, that God had called her, you know, to preach the truth. And not simply the truth of the gospel, but the truth of, 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 of social justice, if you will, the truth of, of equity. Um, you know, she saw the evils and the injustice of slavery through a biblical lens. And she became a great activist in the abolitionist movement. And even, you know, more so in the, in the women's suffragist movement or the, you know, women who fought for the right to vote, where she often um, took many white women to task um, you know, notably um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was unwilling to support um, black black people gaining the right to vote if um, that did not include women. And at the time, Truth felt that you know you need to you need to be supportive of any you know any type of voting practice. You know, she she believed that you know clearly women should have you know should have had the right to vote. And she was fighting for that, but she again, you know, was saying that we have to stay on, you know, stay on the path path of progress. So she was not a woman who was in these spaces with whites who was keeping quiet or was simply happy to be there. But to her name, you know, she always spoke the truth, and she always spoke about gender not being a reason to discriminate. You know, that, you know, that women had, you know, the, 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 the same ability and, you know, ability to preach the gospel and serve in ministry just like men. So, you know, she always preached, you know, a, a gospel of equity as it related to gender, you know, and there are many um, African-American Black academics who call a Sojourner Truth the first womanist uh, theologian, um, the first woman who spoke, you know, to to the humanity and the power of Black women within the context of the church, within the context of ministerial politics, because we know that ministry can very often be um, laden in politics or laden with politics. Excuse me. Another founding mother is uh, Julia Foote. Now, Julia Foote uh, was ordained as a deacon in the AME Zion Church because there was a, there was a split, I believe in 1821, the AME Church split into the AME and the AME Zion um, Church. Um, but she was uh, licensed as, as, as a deacon as a, you know, in, in the AME Zion Church. Um, she was also an itinerant preacher and evangelist for nearly 50 years before she was ordained. Because the sad thing about uh, Foote's ordination, Miss Foote's ordination, 
is that it came when she, you know, later in life, when she was a, you know, when she was a much older woman. Now I'm not an ageist, you know, by any stretch of the, uh, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, because we know that our seasoned senior saints are still doing great things and can always accomplish great things in, in ministry. But clearly because of all the work that Julia Foote was doing in ministry, she should have been, she should have been, um, licensed in or, or she, excuse me, she should have been ordained uh, much earlier in her life. And I want to say something about, um, you see the word preacher and evangelist. And, you know, too often, you know, we, we you know, many people in, in, in our tradition tend to, you know, view the term evangelist very lightly. They say, oh, well, that's, you know, that's a woman, you know, who you know, who can, you know, who can preach or should, you know, should be licensed to minister. So we'll give her that title of, 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 of evangelist. That's something that, um, you know, that my pastor often, you know, talks about when he talks about sexism uh, within, within the church. Um, but when you see that, uh, that Julia Foote was a preacher and an evangelist, I mean, she was an evangelist in the truest sense of the word when you talk about witnessing for Christ and bringing people to a saving knowledge of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Because when you read her autobiography and you see the passion that she had for the lost, the passion that she had for, for, for saving people, the passion that she had for witnessing, you know, I don't want you to read this or see this and think that that was just a simple title or, 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 or characterization. I mean, that was, that was a part of her very, very fiber and being. She had a passion uh, for the lost and she wanted to bring as many people to Christ as possible. And she did that through clearly through preaching, but also witnessing. And she again had an extensive preaching context or territory between New York, the greater Eastern seaboard, Ohio, and even, um, even, can, even, even Canada. But what's important about her ordination within the AME Zion Church, even though it came late um, in life, is that, you know, this is the first account that I read of where a woman was granted um, the right to administer holy sacraments. Again, you know, late, you know, and that's, you know, that is, you know, that's my position, you know, late, uh, which, which I think is, you know, in, you know, which I think is, is important within the context of ministry, but, you know, just keeping with the historical record. Now, as we transition into the, the 20th century, I want to share with you a quote from Dr. Carter G. Woodson, as we were talking about the, um, you know, the, the, the creation of, you know, the celebration of African American history uh, month, which we know came, evolved out of uh, Negro History Week, which was created uh, by Dr. Carter G. Woodson. Now, this seminal quote was from Woodson's work, The History of the Negro Church, which uh, was written in 1921. But he speaks to the power of the African-American church. Woodson speaks, the church then is no longer the voice of one person crying in the wilderness, but a spiritual organization at last becoming alive to the needs of a people handicapped by social distinctions of which the race must, grad must gradually free itself to do here in this life, that which will assure the larger life to come. To attain this, the earth must be made habitable for civilized people. Funds are daily raised in Negro churches to fight segregation and an innocent Negro in danger of suffering injustice at the hands of the local oppressor may appeal with success to the communicants with whom he has frequented a common altar. And it should say with whom, you know, they have frequented a common altar. The National Association for the Advancement of Colored People would be unable to carry out its program without the aid of the Negro Church. And one of the common truths of the Black 
church, of the African-American church. When Woodson wrote this in 21, in 1921, that's true in 2021, is that the base of the black church is black women. So when you talk about the black church being able to do anything, just remember and be encouraged and stand on when you're frustrated the truth that the base of the black church is black women. So when you're talking about raising funds, where are those funds coming from? They're coming from businesses. They're coming from businesses controlled by black women, participated in by black women. You know, so when we, you know, we need to be mindful of that. So when Woodson is talking about the power of the of the black church at the turn, you know, early in the 20th century, that power comes largely and significantly through through the presence and participation and activism of black women. And that's not an opinion, that is a fact. So when we think about building the black church, creating the black church, you know, a number of denominations were created clearly in the, 1800, the, the 1800s, um, especially after reconstruction or during and after Reconstruction. But when we talk about building the Black church, I think without question, one of the quintessential best examples of building the Black church is the story of Violet A. Johnson. And Violet A. Johnson was a domestic worker from North Carolina. And she founded the, the Fountain Baptist Church of which I am a member, of which Reverend, Reverend Porter is the son of and came out of. She founded the Fountain Baptist Church of Summit, New Jersey. And Ms. Johnson was led to establish the church out of a prayer group that she led. So once again, you know, we see God using people that we might look past or look over, you know, Ordinary people, you know, you've, you've heard preachers say it before, God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. You know, here's this woman who's leading this prayer group. Now she's led to organize a church. And it's because she saw the institutional power of the African-American church. She saw the practical viability of the African-American church. Ms. Johnson viewed the church as a necessary institution in the community, which could help politically and morally steer the growing black community in that area. And Violet Johnson, in addition to being a church planter, because if we want to use the popular language, she was a church planter because she planted a church. Um, she was also an activist. Um, and, you know, this quote I pulled from, uh, Dr. Betty Adams' book, Black Women's uh, Christian Activism. And Johnson was vice president of the Women's Home and Foreign Ministry Society, Missionary Society of, uh, of the New England Missionary Baptist Convention, which still is in existence to this, to this day. She was uh, vice president of the Women's Convention of the National Baptist Convention. She was a trustee of the National Training School for Women and Girls in Washington, D.C., Vice President of the New Jersey State Federation of Colored Women's Clubs, which was an activist organization and chair of its anti-lynching department, even a deeper level of activism, because, you know, we, we still, um, you know, we, we, we still have yet to have an anti-lynching bill signed. You know, it was just recently turned, you know, um, got, got shut down in the house again. Um, she was a local and state officer in the Colored Women's Republican Club. That's when the Republican Party was completely different from what it is now. Um, after the gold, you know, before this is before the Goldwater Revolution, and a leader of its junior division. And she was a founder of and vice president of the Summit NAACP. So not only was this woman a a, a plant a church planter, but she saw the planting of a church 
as a vehicle through which to also engage in activist activity, which would improve the lives of black people in her city and in, 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 in her state. So, you know, when we think about the, the, the purpose and the mission of the black church, you know, we see it within the mission and ministry of Ms. Violet A. Johnson. Now, when we think about preaching equity and justice, I have to call the name of Reverend Florence Spearing Randolph. Now, Ms. Randolph was ordained as an elder in the AME Zion Church, which is, you know, like being ordained, you know, ordained as a as a as a minister, if you will. Reverend Florence Spearing Randolph founded the Wallace Chapel. AME Zion Church in Summit, New Jersey. Reverend Randolph also led the New Jersey Foreign Missionary Society and served as a board member of the New Jersey Women's Suffrage Association. She also organized the New Jersey State Federation of Colored Women's Club. She was known, and Reverend Randolph was, as, as, as you know, my aunties and, and uncles would say, um, she took no tea for the fever. You know, she was known for her direct and pragmatic preaching style. And she always addressed topics of racism and sexism um, from her pulpit. She also addressed the intersectionality between, um, you know, uh, or, or with or the intersectionality of um, racism and sexism within the context of women's rights and um, women's opportunities. So she confronted the sexism that was present within the African-American church. Because even though she was ordained as an elder, of course she was ordained begrudgingly. Um, you know, all of these women that, were, that I'm talking about, whether it be Irina Lee, whether it be Julia Foote or whether it be Reverend, um, Reverend Florence Spearing Randolph, all still encountered great obstacles within their denominations because of the fact that they were women. And they still achieved greatly. Imagine what these women could have done with all that they've done, you know, because as you can see, they all had extensive you know, ministry careers that lasted decades. And imagine with all that they could have, could have accomplished, imagine what they could have, uh, have accomplished um, had, had other people who had sexist beliefs um, gotten rid of their sexism or, or, or threw off their sexism and got, and became, got on one accord with a Florence Spearing Randolph, got on one accord with a Julia Foote, got on one accord with a Urena Lee or a Sojourner Truth. You know, so with all of the, the what these women accomplished, they did it in the face of racism and in the face of sexism. And a lot of and and, and a lot of the sexism that they encountered, they encountered within their denominational context you know, which is, which is unfortunate. And also I just wanted to mention that Florence Sparing Randolph was, you know, a, a, a contemporary of uh, Viola Johnson because they were both in the city of Summit at the same time, you know, so that is, you know, so that's a, that, that, that's a powerful pair. You know, we got the, we got the sons of thunder. What about the daughters of thunder? Violet Johnson and, and, and Reverend Florence Spearing Randolph. Also, when we think about preaching equity and justice, we have to talk about Dr. Prathia Hall. Dr. Prathia Hall was born and raised in Philadelphia. Um, she was a, a, a preacher's kid. Her father founded uh, Mount Sharon Baptist Church in, in Philly in 1938. Um, she create she credits her father for her theological underpinnings because she always because she characterized him as a freedom faith preacher. Um, you know, talk, you know, who who preached extensively about civil rights and, and African American people 
um, having having rights, whether it's economic justice, whether whether it's uh, justice at the polls. Um, you know, she learned a lot uh, from her father. She was she got more involved in the civil rights. Well, she had an experience where she had to where she was traveling south with her with her family as an early teen and had that experience that I've had relatives tell me about where they're taking a train from, you know, Jersey or Pennsylvania down south. And, you know, they get to that spot, you know, like once you get to Maryland, you know, you got to you got to move your seat. And, you know, she talked about, you know, how that, you know, made her feel. Um, So on the heels of that, you know, she said, I, I need to get involved in this movement. Um, you know, she participated, um, in a sit-in at, you know, in, in Philadelphia at a, at a, a, at a store, a lunch counter that did not, um, serve, serve black people. And then from that point on, you know, from her time at Temple University where she, you know, where she graduated, um, she really got involved in the, in the civil rights movement, you know, mainly after she graduated, she joined SNCC, um, and then she was really threw herself uh, full fledged into the movement. And, you know, you know, Prathia Hall, you know, Prathia Hall's voice without knowing who Prathia Hall was. Because you've heard Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. And that came from Prathia Hall, you know, praying a certain, praying a certain prayer. And I just want to share this short video clip with with you um, from Dr. Henry Louis Gates's uh, uh, series, The Black Church. And you may have seen this. So if you have seen it, um, awesome. But let me just share this with you. Prathia Hall is one of many women who uh, has not gotten her just due. In fact, Martin Luther King Jr. uh, was a part of a uh, mass meeting here in in rural Georgia. And while he was in that mass meeting, she began to talk to God aloud about what she desired for the world. And over and over again, she kept saying to God, I have a dream. Really? This was in Terrell County, Georgia. Uh, I believe in 1962. And so people need to know that before it was Martin's dream, it was Prathia's prayer. I knew Prathia. I did ask her. You did? I did ask her. And she said, yes, it was true. He came to one of their rallies and she led the prayer service. And she said when she was driving him to the airport, he said, I love the way you did that. Hmm. I'm, I'm going to use that. Now, she did not put all that content between I have a dream Mm -hmm. and what he's saying, Mm -hmm. but just the motif. I have a dream. Mm -hmm. I have a dream today. That was Prathia Hall. All right. So in closing, I'd like to uh, talk briefly about Black women in the 21st century church and where we are. First and foremost, Black women are still the physical, organizational, financial, and and, fi- and financial base of the Black church. Because 66 to 88% of all Black church members are women. Um, there aren't any, there are no Black churches where men are, you know, are the majority. Black women are receiving more pastoral appointments, but unfortunately, they are still uh, behind men, which means that we are still fighting and dealing with and confronted with some of the same systemic issues that Urena Lee faced, that Julia Foote faced, that um, Prathia Hall faced. So we still have, you know, work to do. Uh, Prathia Hall, uh, who denominationally was a Baptist, um, 
joined the uh, Philadelphia Ministers Baptist Ministers Convention, and she joined that organization in 1982, and she was the first woman in 1982. So um, we still have work to do because we still in 2021 have denominations that um, do not uh, see fit to license or ordain women. Um, however, black women, one growth area we see is in the academy. Black women are pursuing theological education at a higher rate than black, than black men. Thus the seminary has become a place or the academy has become a place where black women have distinguished themselves not simply as students, but also as faculty, as thinkers and writers. So we have, so black women have found a safe space where they are consistently contributing, thus they're consistent contributors theologically through their thinking and their writing about our faith and their experience. So when you think about how so much of our worship and practice as black people was shaped and informed by the matriarchs, our ancestors who survived the middle passage and preserved ways of encountering and remembering God. Here we are in the 21st century. And now from the shores in the villages of West Africa to the Academy of the Western world, we have African-American women, black women who are thinking and writing theology and articulating how we as a church community um, think worship, experience, and encounter God. What a mighty God we serve. I thank you for your time. I appreciate your listening. May God bless you all. And I don't know if anyone has any questions, but I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. I think you're muted. You're muted, Sister Newton. Yeah, it says you're muted, at least on my it's screen. Still muted, Deborah. I can't even take you off. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Reverend Moore, for that lovely uh, presentation. And if there be any questions, you can entertain them at this time. Anyone from the group? Any questions? Uh, good afternoon. This is Sandra. Thank you very much, Reverend Moore. Very interesting and, and, and enlightening. Thank you. My yes. pleasure. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, question. Well, I see this is being recorded. Will it be posted? So say folks that didn't have access to Zoom, they would be able to at least listen to the audio part? Yes. 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 Once, we get once we get permission to be able to do so from our presenters as well. Okay, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Okay. Okay. Any questions for, for both of our presenters, actually? Um, I was thinking as um, both of them were speaking <clears throat> and, and particularly as it relates to uh, women um, and from a biblical perspective, we know that God created us all equal and mm -hmm. we have our roots in our matriarchal uh, traditions and however mm -hmm. we're still facing gender biases mm -hmm. not just mm -hmm. in, the, in the church but uh, globally, uh, globally you know, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. why do you think that still exists yeah you know um we understand we, we get the prejudice that they they've kind of tried to justify it anyway uh, through scriptures but if god has created us all equal why does the gender biases still exist even in the church and maybe some of the ministers that's online, female ministers, have experienced that too. What has been your experience? I think um, it, it's it's a fear of not just 
losing power, but of sharing power. And people don't understand that we are all, we all have the same power. You know, I mean, I may be able to do something better than you might be able to do it. So that's my strength. Okay. And you, or, or um, uh, Reverend Moore, you guys maybe, you know, we have different, different abilities. God gave us all unique abilities to come. If we all did the same thing, we wouldn't get anything accomplished. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would, I would also submit, um, unfortunately, given, given our experience with racism, um, historically as, as, as people of color, um, you know, and I have heard older, uh, women in my life and in ministry and who have been going to church for a long time, you know, who have gone home to be with the Lord and they would, you know, they would say things that, well, you know, uh, the, you know, black men have, you know, so little, um, you know, let's just, you know, we'll just, just, you know, I'm paraphrasing, but, you know, just, just give them to church, you know, because that's one place where a black man, you know, you know, has, has some dignity and respect and authority, you know, so I, you know, was exposed to, you know, growing up women, you know, who were, were aware of sexism as all women are aware of sexism because unfortunately they counter it, encounter it so regularly um, that they just say, you know, they, they just deferred, but they, you, but they justified it because of racism experienced by the black man. And my only question is, well, if this, if you know that this is what black men are experiencing, how much more are, how much more oppression are black women experiencing by, you know, deferring um, to this, to this patriarchal structure? You know, because we don't, you know, we don't get better with one person leading. I mean, you know, with one gender leading, we we grow, you know, in 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 community in community. We have to work, you know, we have to work together, and you know, and we have to move beyond, you know, our patriarchal fears and you know, our, you know, patriarchally based fears and insecurities, and you know, recognize that. You know, it's not about, <clears throat> you know, it's not about gender. And the funny thing, one of my, I was talking to one of my former professors um, and we were talking about some, you know, schoolwork and he was just saying, you know, in your reading, make sure you, you know, you include the writings of womanist theologians and, 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 black, and black women writers because he said, he said, because it's the women that are natural leaders you know, in, 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 in our church and in our community and, and, and throughout our history. He said, don't get trapped into that patriarchal line of thinking. You know, he said, make sure, you know, which I have and I did, but, you know, I mean, I did, have and did, you know, read, um, not think about, you know, male privilege. Um, but, you know, he said, you know, I, I realized, you know, that you know, I have, you know, I need to always acknowledge that and, and, and honor that. Um, so, yeah, it's just a, a question of power, question of insecurity. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. And we also have a comment in the chat um, from uh, Tamara Horn. Um, and she's just made mention, amen, Reverend Moore. In addition, the household were, households were led by men. More women are equal household leaders and single household leaders today. So we women do more on our own. And that's a true statement. <laughs> um, not necessarily was designed to be that way initially, but th that, that's what we find oftentimes. And so we know that women are capable of leading, but yet still we still see this disparity even in our churches. Um, any other comments or questions? I just wanted to say, even though I know we're talking, we're talking more on an African-American perspective here today, but in working with, I work with a nonprofit faith-based organization and just a year or so ago, we had a, um, a conference where we had all women. There was rabbis, there were Jewish, you know, we had them from every denomination. 
And I was truly shocked to see and understand that it's a universal thing. And the, and the women in some of the other um, denominations, they are even more suppressed than where we have come from an African-American perspective. And I was truly shocked like some of the Jewish um, leaders and some of our pastors, they, it, it would really amaze you if you hear the suppression of women, even in all of those, because they haven't even come in some areas where it looks like it, they haven't come as far as we have even in the African-American community. It would amaze you. That was all I had to say. And in, in piggybacking uh, even on that and what uh, um, uh, Ms. Sister uh, Tamara said is it may be uh, in part to the fact that a lot of our, in our community have been uh, forced, if you will, to be leaders in our home. And so that may uh, attribute a lot to um, that in, in our churches as well, as opposed to other cultures in um in churches, I don't know, but I'm, I'm making that an, an assumption on my own. So any other questions or comments as we go forward? I would just like to say something. Hello sure. everyone, um, Reverend Moore, that was excellent, par excellent, very nice. Um, I've been in churches where um, not per se the black church, but in, in white churches that still keep women from the pulpit. And they don't know that the word can be given from the floor to the door. So it really, you know, doesn't matter because it's the word that's most important. But as I was talking to my husband, he was saying, you know, and, and we read quite often that the lineage came in Africa from the female side. That's what the dowry was for because the power of the woman at that time was was most important. So it, it's very important to know that, you know, not only are we helpmates, but we we do our portion, you know, and, and it's very um, special. And, and I really appreciate the presentation because it shows the power of the black woman, let alone the woman in general, because there is no gender in Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Rawls, for the, those comments. Um, we still have a few more minutes. Anybody else? I would like to ask if, sister, if Minister Keisha uh, would say more about what God is doing in her life as a minister, how she has come up. She's talked about where she was and where she's at. How is God using you in 2021 to have an impact and a visual eye that other young women that may be led into the ministry can benefit from what you're doing in the community that you're in? Well, I tell you, I want, first of all, 2020 itself was, um, it was strenuous. I know it was strenuous for a lot of people, but not only did I have the COVID, my stepmother had it as well. So, you know, and I was determined, I was determined, I because I am a strong believer in God will bring me through it. He did not, like I said, he did not give us these things to leave us there. And, you know, just to, even while I was at the hospital, the doctors, they looked at me, they said, are you sure you sick? Yes, I am, but I have a higher doctor. <laughs> He gives me common sense. And then, you know, I, I I don't want our young people, not even just our young women, but even our young men to know that, you know, God is not, he's nothing to be played with. He is true. He is real. You know, just because you can't see the air, but you know what's there. You know, you, you breathe because the air is there. God is there for whatever is needed. And he is a provider and he does not hold our past against us. And that is why a lot of us, you know, we have a problem of moving forward because we say, oh, well, no, I was a hooker. I was a drug addict. I was this, I, but God is trying to get them 
us to where he wants us to be. Those things are things that we use as a testimony to allow other people see, oh, well, if you, you were locked up and you got how many books? You are what? Oh, okay, well, I can do it too. And, you know, because it's all about we have to see ourselves as God sees us. Amen. <laughs> Amen to that. Uh, we have a few more minutes. Anybody else have a question? Comment? I do it's me again. To... Wait, wait, go, to... go ahead, Keisha. Go ahead, okay. Keisha. I do want to uh, put it out there that I do have a special for everyone who will even be listening to the replay. If you want to purchase the uh, Soulful Affirmations, you will save $8 on it. Um, you would just visit bit.ly Soulful Affirmations dash CCOGP. And I will put that in the comments. Okay. And then you use the uh, code of CCOGP, you will get that uh, $8 off of your order. And for the first 100 orders, I am autographing all the books and including some other free gifts in there. Amen. 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 Thank you for putting that in the chat so that we can, because I didn't get it. So I'm sure. <laughs> okay, I got it. <laughs> Thank you. Reverend Porter, yes, you had uh, a question. Yes. Yes. I would just like to applaud my friend and my brother, my fellow laborer in the gospel. Yes. Uh, both of you, both of you, um, uh, Minister Keisha and Reverend Moore, uh, for the excellent presentation. And I, I'm grateful uh, that you were available to share with us at this particular time in this particular space, because you've been a blessing to all of us. And you've been such a blessing that this is going to be posted that others can benefit from the richness that you have poured into our lives this day. And I thank you for that from the bottom of my heart. Amen. It's my honor to serve, Reverend you. Porter. Thank you. Amen. I, I just want to have one last comment before we uh, wrap this up. And, and, and it was something, uh, a couple of things that was said from birth, both per, uh, presenters. And it's basically, God sees me. Whether I'm male or female, God sees me. And we are created in his image. And therefore, we can pursue that which he has uh, called us to do. And I, I'm thankful to both of you for uh, your presentations. And I'm also, I learned something today as far as some forerunners that came before Minister Keisha and Reverend Rawls and Reverend Yasha. There are some forerunners that I didn't know about that I learned about today. And I'm so glad and thankful for that because our predecessors sets the stage. And as you said, they, they, they we can, build from their shoulders off of their shoulders and and um go forward and do what God has called us to do. And so we don't take it lightly that we have these people, these examples before us who went through all the obstacles and, and all the oppression and, and, and all the biases so that we could have it easier. So that you, we, we all can have it easier as we go forward. So again, we want to thank both of you, all of you, for your guests, uh, Reverend uh, Minister uh, Peterson and Reverend Moore, for accepting the invitation to come and to share with us today. Uh, yes, applause are in, in, in order. And we thank all of you for your attendance and your participation. And we hope that you truly enjoyed this experience. And we also, by way of announcement, make sure you look in the... Um, in the chat and get soulful affirmations bit bit dot l y slash soulful affirmations and the uh, code to use is ccog so that you can receive um the discount for books um for minister peterson as well as added gifts <laughs> And also, um, we look forward to some of you joining us next week, Friday, March 26th at 7 p.m. for the New Jersey State Christian Women uh, Connection virtual book discussion event as well. And we hope you have your books and are reading the Building Beautiful Lives Out of Broken Pieces. Thank you, Sister Alfreda, for posting that. So that we will have that next weekend. And until we meet again, thank you all so much. God bless you. And we hope that you enjoy the rest of your day.
day. Thank you so much. You too. Yes, unmute yourselves. Yes, and give them a their applause. Give them Thank you.